That's a clean glass. That is definitely a clean glass. <clears throat> I gained five experience. So, um, this time we're going to talk about a little campaign that I like to call The Village of Hamlet. Uh, it was uh, a number of years ago. I was playing with uh, 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 Tyson and, and, and Jordan. Uh, if, you, if you've been watching along, you would know them as the, uh, the, the uh, Jet the Orc and 3Q the Strongman. As well as Linus Corban, the the John McClane hacker ripoff, and uh, and uh, the Catman of Chicago. Uh, the game that we were playing in particular was Hackmaster Fourth Edition. And if you're familiar at all with Hackmaster, you know, I mean, and if you've been paying attention to our groups, I mean, you know, it's a horrible twenty car pileup train wreck. And, and this is as intended at the time. So, Hackmaster was right up our alley. In, I don't know, I guess, tribute of the, the total rip-off nature of Hackmaster, I, I, I kind of started modeling it after one of my favorite campaigns um, in D&D, The Temple of Elemental Evil. So I started off, so I started off with you know, the, the starting module, The Village of Hamlet. Of course, you know, it's, it's you know, Hackmaster, so I had to change it up, and I called it the village of Hamlet. So it starts off, and the two party, the two members of the party, are an elf thief and a gnome titan. Gnome titan with a giant axe. That's why he was called Axe, because he was a gnome titan with an axe. It's the most notable feature on him, and most noticeable, really. It's like he's like a flag. Now, immediately, the gnome titan. Uh, being played by Tyson, immediately starts, you know, exploring the town and, and, and doing the D&D &D thing. The other guy decides he's going to go to the tavern and get drunk. Where, you know, uh, he, he met one of the colorful members of the tavern, the, the, the tavern keeper with the whip. The, the, the running gag was, is they would comment that the beer was, was, was warm, and so he'd say, oh, I'm sorry, go in the back and come out with a whip that was frosted with ice. The, 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 the ultimate joke there being that eventually when they did get back there, they found out that he had an ice elemental uh, strapped to his kegs, keeping them cold. And he would just go back there and, and whip them. He, he just sat there, and, and he had to be poked and prodded to get out of this, this, this tavern. I, I, I think eventually the Gnome Titan met up with him. I've never met someone before who was so against playing while they role-played. It was just in saying to me. I'm thinking, all right, let's get in character and talk about this. It's like, all right, what do I talk about? Whatever your character talk about, what's that? Why is your character here? To uh, just do this thing. Well, then do this thing! Oh, is that what I do? So they start talking, and, you know, the Gnome Titan's trying. He's trying. For God's sakes, he's trying. The, the guy's a role player, and he was trying. So, you know, why are you in town? He says, I'm here to do some stuff. And, and the Gnome Titan was like, oh, you're going to rape and murder every toddler in the town? No, I've got more nefarious purposes, he responds. That's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, now, you guys don't know this. And I don't think he knew this. The Gnome Titan knew this because I said it loudly and proudly at the table. There is a city guardsman sitting right next to you. I'm thinking to myself, how can I distance myself, my character, from his character? We hadn't officially really formed a party yet. I was just asking what he was doing, and then... So the city guardsman is now paying rapt attention to these guys. There are other off-duty city guardsmen, and he kind of, you know, gives them a signal because they're city guardsmen. Why wouldn't they have a special hand signal? Now, what I didn't tell about this town was... There was something not right about this town. The end result was, and this isn't a big this is not a big leap in logic, but the town formed an angry mob. We're talking torch and pitchforks. Like, like almost immediately formed an angry mob and started chasing this guy 
through the streets of this town. I was like, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be killed through association. Even though I haven't said anything to back myself up as being affiliated with him. So, they're out for blood. And who steps forward to give them blood? The gnome titan who's totally jonesing for some combat. Lemonade. Why not distance myself officially by saying I'm going to kill him? And they wanted it to be creative. Thankfully, I spent a lot of days watching some horror movies, so it came to mind really quickly as to how exactly I would do this. So, the next 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 real minutes, is literally him just describing in excruciating detail. I wasn't sure how the spade was going to fit in there, but all I did was how he horribly mutilates... I figured, hey, why not climb on in? And tortures. That's when the scene burst. And kills. About six quarts of blood in the elf body. And uh, good, because there was a lot to go around then. The elf. And the village is happy. They're, they love this. They are ecstatic with this because they, they want blood, you know? Like I said, the town was supposed to be off and peculiar. Um, so, you know, he kind of goes, oh, well, they got me. He was in relatively good spirits about it, which, you know, whatever. He, there was some argument there, but he, he understood. He eventually understood and was kind of cool with it. And, you know, he just said, you know, like, you know, here's the book. Here's the character sheet. Roll up another character. He was the brother of the guy that first died because Hackmaster has rules for that. And he was there to claim the body. I think he was just trying to pickpocket to get some extra money to pay for drinks or to order pay to recover his brother's body. And so, once again, the town, having none of this, angry mob. And angry mob once again chases him through town. He runs along the exact same route. The exact same thing happens. And who steps up? The gnome titan. Gnome Titan steps up, and once again we get we have another another glorious 20-minute description of this horrible, awful torture. I think this one involved a fork, and a fork decapitation, and the head eventually rolled down the sewer. The character quickly got out of hand, but you know what? The town liked him, and I said, sure, I'll go with it if it's the one thing that I can do here, because otherwise the plot wasn't progressing. This next character came into town, once again angered the town, once again got chased by the town, but this one was smart and ran into the sewer where he found the head. After brutally maiming and killing the third guy, the town loved the Gnome Titan so much, they decided to make him like the most honored position in the town, short of the mayor, which is city executioner. Um... Because a good way to describe this town is, especially when it came to executions, is uh, if you've ever seen Cannibal the Musical, uh, the song "Hang 'Em High." That that's that's pretty much pretty, pretty much the best description I could give you for this town with executions. So the player of the Gnome Titan is like, all right, you know. You know, that's fine. You know, I can't play my character anymore. But you know what? He got a, he, he got a good outcome. That'll teach me. Lost my character because I was playing him as best as I could given the situation. So, you know what? Sure, I'll go ahead and make a character. So he went back to the book, was flipping through the book, came across half ogre. Rolled up a half ogre. Now... He wanted a lot of stuff for this half ogre. And uh, normally you can only get like. He rolled great on the table of faults. It, or horrible, however you look at it. He, he saw the quirks and flaw charts and said yes. Now, I don't know if I. If he was within the, the, the limit that you're allowed for quirks and flaws. There's a limit? <laughs> or if I was just being. Cool, and letting him get more. I thought, let's handicap him a little bit. Give him something eccentric to start. He eventually ended up with something like drools. Uh, I think he had a limp. Half deaf. Half deaf. 
strange body odor, and I, th I, th I think there was one that was like, you're, you're an idiot. I may have gone a little overboard on the amount of flaws I gave him, but at the same time, I gave him characteristics no one would forget. And um, to match this, his name was Two. And, and that consisted of a large majority of his, of, of his vocabulary. Not, uh, not like Hodor extremes, but just kind of, you know, two. And, and it, 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 it was that specifically to, 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 to our European viewers of two. Because he didn't know any better. I like to clarify that most of the time when he said two, he actually went two. Because once again, he... He didn't have it all connected in his head. Two um, just comes walking into this town, and he's a half ogre. So to the town people, he's just a tall guy. And I add a new thing to this town that I should have added earlier, but there was space on this like hand-drawn map that I was doing for it. Yes, I actually mapped it out this time. First time ever, I think. Um, uh, city Arena. So he joined the City Arena, and he just fought. In the city, in, in, in this arena. Eventually, he got so popular in the arena, I NPC'd this character as well because he was just, the town loved him. He was just, he was, he was a celebrity. And that's my reward for making characters that did well. That yeah, um, taken away. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, the best part about him, I remember though, is when he had to fight two orcs. Two had to fight two orcs in the arena. No, no, it was either two orcs, or it was just like a group of orcs that he had to fight. Now, I didn't have the DM guide at the time, so I didn't have the two hit charts, so I was winging it. And, like, he, like, beat two of the orcs by, like, stepping on one of them. And I ruled that, like, you know, with his roll, his foot got caught in the orc. So, and he couldn't get it out, because he's kind of slow, he, you know, just wouldn't you know, slip it off, you know, or, or pull the orc apart or anything like that. So he decides, screw it. Walks up to another dead orc body, lodges his foot in that, and just started walking around with two dead orcs' shoes. For the rest of the campaign. Bad odor just got worse. Yeah, it... He didn't care. It smelled bad enough as it was. I mean, you know, a, a desiccated, decaying orc, he smelled worse than that. So... I mean, we're all laughing, having a grand old time. But eventually the plot's got to show up. But on the next day on the horizon, uh, they woke up to find army of humans on one side, army of elves on the other side, army of dwarves and army of gnomes. And they've all surrounded this town on their own respective sides because, you know, one path up, you know, one path down for each kingdom. Because, like, this, this village was in the middle of this mountain range, which was almost impassable, and it was right in the middle of this big supercontinent. Yeah, that was it. It was right in the middle of this big supercontinent between, like, a human kingdom, a gnomish kingdom, an elvish kingdom, and a dwarven kingdom, and they were all at war with each other. But they couldn't fight a conventional war because the way this island was shaped is it was like a big, you know, like a big cross, essentially. So whoever can take and hold this town, you know, kind of a... A valuable place, you know. Plus, you know, it's an ex-volcano, so, you know, a bunch of valuable minerals in there that s science class has told me exist in volcanoes. It was the most complicated version of King of the Mountain ever. Yeah. So they start, and, and so begins the Battle of Meat Grinder Rock. I think I stole that name from Knights of the Dinner Table. But yeah, it was Meat Grinder Rock, which was this really weird rock formation that if you kind of tilted your head this way, it looked like a barrel organ. That was a running gag, and I don't, I don't even remember what the significance of it was. The elf uh, immediately joins the elf army, because he he's like four or five brothers down at this point. He, he wants some revenge on this town. Um, and the guy that was playing too... Um, just kept like interjecting. This 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 general would like give an order, and he would just there, and he'd, like, he was like playing like the 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 kiss ass, the the suck up, if you will. You ever do an offhanded comment like you're a commentator on Mystery Science Theater 3000, and 
then that just becomes its own character after a while. That's how we got Brown Nose. Eventually, he had just kind of like interjected as this Private Brown Nose so many times that he's like, can I make Private Brown Nose? And I'm like, yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> oh, and Private Brown Nose was, was also the first elf to successfully enter this town and get out alive. Because he and Jordan's character were a part of a, 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 a small like scouting force that was sent into the town ahead of time. And he made it out. Everyone else didn't. Uh, once again, Axe horribly murdered them in the arena. So see, he's got this character. Uh, Private Brown knows. And I just kind of half-heartedly make, make up this character, uh, the Sarge. And he's, you know, every grizzled Sarge in an army movie ever. You know? Grizzled and a sergeant. And he starts off and he's being the grizzled sergeant to Private Brown Nose. And Brown Nose is just there and Brown Nose just does his job and somehow comes back from everything he's done ever. He grew into one of the earliest examples I have of a mature, well thought out character who progressed in a naturalistic way and assumed leadership roles and took on the positions of military leading. Private Brown Nose becomes General Brown Nose and takes over the entire elven army. This this was, of course, after the, the, the previous general of the elven army uh, went insane and, and, and horribly got himself and a good portion of his army murdered because a large army of orcs, ogres, and trolls showed up to defend the town. Uh, and the person that was in charge of them was um, the mayor of the town. As I mentioned before, the, 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 the executioner was the second most prestigious part of this town. The mayor was the most prestigious part because you got to control the evil orc, orcish horde of doom. So this four-way fight eventually became a four-on-one and really was more of a two-and-a-half-on-one after this elven general uh, went insane. Um, which they, had, they, they eventually had to call for reinforcements. Uh, while this was going on, somewhere in there, uh, Jordan's character got like captured by the humans and eventually defected to the humans because it was found out that their general was his father who had defected from the elven kingdom uh, like 300 years ago because he's an elf and he can do that. And the running gag with him was, is, um, I had him like a big, like, <laughs> type of guy, you know, you, you know the type. And he was always telling him to pipe. <laughs> and upon meeting his dad and seeing this guy, I immediately told him that, like, on his shoulder appeared one of those little, like, devil angel guys who started poking him in the side of the neck with his little pit angel pitchfork. Don't ask. And, 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 and probably one of the most offensive accents I can muster, which I'm going to muster now, he was, More British! More British! Tugging him on to be more British, like his, you know, <laughs> father. And that war continued, and it continued, and it continued. And eventually it just kind of ended because we reached a part where I couldn't even remember what it was I was trying to do with this campaign. It had gone on for so long and so much had happened that it just kind of, to quote a comedian, slowly collapsed like a flan in a cupboard. It's, that's, 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 that's the best way I could describe this campaign. It had just gotten to the point where it just, there it, it, it was too much going on, nobody could remember a thing. I do remember the Maypole event, though. I was going to talk about the Maypole event. Where, where one of the, at randomly one of the one of the third people we got, um, got arrested by the town. Yes, they actually arrested somebody for once. They they wrapped barbed wire around his neck, and Axe invited all the kids to come down, 
with this razor wire and maypole him to death. I did not apologize for the maypole idea. The maypole idea was just, what's the most horribly graphic thing that they could possibly involve the children in the execution of? And maybe I should apologize for it, but the idea stuck. That's the story of the uh, village of... Uh, <laughs> we're called the village of Hamlet, the campaign. It was it was quite a train wreck. So yeah, um, the moral of the story there is just because um, the train has left the track and is six states over, that doesn't mean you still can't have fun with what's going on. So so just because things don't go to plan and you forget the you forget the plot, you can still have fun with it. Um, that's all I gotta say about that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm the DM and, uh, keep your stick on the ice. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go, because a friend of mine promised me he was gonna get me some tacos for dinner, so I'm a fat guy who wants to eat some tacos. <laughs> Wait, and now the credits me just slowly drinking this beer. Mm-hmm. The best, best, best credit sequence ever. It's not rated R. Yep, 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 yep. It's not rated R. It's a man, a man drinking! Oh, it's rated right. right. <laughs> <laughs> it Yes, yes it is. A film or, or, or something, I don't know. It's bugs and shit. Bugs and shit. This is probably the most... Probably the most on-topic episode I had so far. Which is... <laughs> except, when, except when it ended. It just kind of petered off there, which is... Kind of very apt, because that's pretty much how the campaign ended. It just kind of petered off. <laughs> True. It actually kind of reminds me of my first D&D &D campaign. Yeah. In the beginning, but that, and after that, uh, that's where the simulator, simularities left. You remember your first D&D &D campaign? Yeah, it was a thief, and I backstabbed that level 4 guy. Oh, yeah. And stole all his loot and stuffed him in his box and buried him and kept stealing shit <sighs> from Jordan. That's right, that's right. <laughs>